John chapter number 8, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him and sat down and taught them, and he taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This said they tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. Lord, I pray that you'd bless the reading and preaching of your word now. We thank you that we have your word. It is a guide. It is a help. It, it is the truth. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to live it, learn it, love it. And, and Lord, just apply it to every part of our lives that we might please you. Thank you, Lord, that somebody took your word and showed it to us. Helped us get saved. And I pray now we'd take it and help us to live right. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I want you to notice there in, in verse number 9, after all that had happened, I mean, there's so much. You could preach here for a month and never have to repeat anything. Um, first of all, Jesus is teaching in the, in the temple. That's a big deal in and of itself. And people are coming and sitting down and listening to him. They wanted to hear from Jesus. Sometimes I wonder if people today want to hear from Jesus. In fact, the very first uh, message that we put out on the internet once we started uh, taping things was uh, anything but Jesus. That seems like that's what a lot of, I'm not talking about the world, that's what a lot of churches are looking for. Yeah. Anything but Jesus. You ask somebody why they chose a church, it's not because Christ was preached, it was because of the, the music or this and the program for me and you know they had a, a deaf ministry or, and I'm not against a deaf ministry or they had a great youth ministry and I'm not against a youth ministry or they had one for albinos with one eye, blue eye and, you know, and, and they have this and that. And there's a lot of ministries that kind of go from reaching whosoever will that narrow down to trying to reach like 0.1% of the population. And I'm not against the 0.1% of the population, but we ought to have a, a broader ministry that's trying to reach everybody, including those people. And, uh, and so you can preach on that. You can preach on the hypocrisy of if the woman was caught in the very act of adultery, why was there not a man drug in with her? That kind of gives you a little insight into the attitude of those who uh, came before Jesus with this question. And, um, and also, you know, the whole idea of, well, back in Jesus' day, you know, everybody acts like everybody got a free, free ride. This woman was about to be stoned to death. In fact, if any of the temple folk had had their hearts right and been right with God, somebody would have picked up a brick and, and hit her and bashed her head in for the glory of God. That's how they got people's attention back then. If they had a teenager that was out of sorts with their parents and they couldn't get them right, they didn't come in and, and blame the Sunday school teacher and the preacher and the counselor at school and the teacher and, and blame all the friends and all the other kids. They, if the kid wouldn't get right with his parents, they'd drag them out and stone them to death right in front of everybody. Yeah. How's that for you? We're going to have snow cones later. <laughs> they'd have a youth outing and bring somebody out and bash their brains in. Does so anybody else want to talk back to their parents? There was a big public, uh, big public shaming, a big public thing. And, and that carried on for years and years all the way up into public hangings. That uh, I just wonder if they, uh, how many people would continue to kidnap and kill people and do things if they would just uh, put executions on the TV. I mean, here's the deal. They put executions on TV all the time. They just do it under the guise of entertainment. Yeah. But if they did it as a, this is what happens, 
you know, I saw a sign, somebody put up a fake sign, it was obviously uh, fooled with, that um, photoshopped or whatever kind of shopped, and it said, um, it said, if you come to Texas, you know, we have this many people that own guns, blah, 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 and this, that, so if you kill anybody here, we will kill you back. But used to, that was the fact, if you killed somebody, you were going to die. They would take you out and put up, a, uh, you know, the gallows or whatever, and, and, and they'd put up the hangman's noose, and man, it'd be a big spectacle. People would come out and say, that's what happens, boy. That's the road you're headed down. Yeah. And uh, you hang out with those kids, listen to that kind of music, you're running with that kind of crowd, and they kill somebody, man, you're going to drop. And watch what happens. It ain't pretty. And it got people's attention. Now, we don't do that today. We have a kinder and a gentler society, and that may or may not be better, but, but that's where we live, and, and so we abide by the laws, and we don't advocate going out and carrying out the, we're not the executioners under any circumstances ever. We ought to hate sin, and we ought to be against sin. We ought not hang out with people that are in, in open sin, but nobody's called us to be the executioner, and, and we're never supposed to be, uh, try to be the executioner, and there's some people that hide behind religion and go out and try to kill people, and that's wicked, that's wrong, and, and it's terrible. We could preach on that, but we're not going to. You could go down and uh, talk about people who were tempting Jesus and how Jesus just ignored them. You know, sometimes we think we have to fight every enemy. We think anybody who doesn't believe just like we do, we have to go to battle with them. And we think that, man, that's, that's what the Internet's for. Is, you know, we're Internet warriors. And, and, and uh, boy, that's our job. If somebody doesn't believe like us, man, we need to get up behind our computer and hide in our mama's basement and just rip them apart. Jesus stooped down and just rode on the ground as if he had never even heard them. They pushed him all the way and he just asked a question. We could preach on that. We're not going to. I want to slide down there to verse number 9. It says, and, when, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. Now, that was the desired result that Jesus was looking for. And notice it started at the eldest. Hopefully that means that some older people had a little bit more sense. Had a little bit more maturity. That's not always the case. But, but we are thankful when it is the case. And, uh, and so I, I like leadership when it's a little bit older. It's scary when you have, you know, the inmates running the asylum. And so, uh, but it said that when they heard it, they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience... I want to preach today on developing a conscience. Developing a conscience. You know, we try to teach our kids, little kids, some, there's some little kids that are brutal. They don't care. They punch other kids. They bite other kids. They'll poke somebody in the eyeball. They steal toys. They're, they're just mean. And if somebody doesn't get a hold of that and stop that, they'll always be mean. And if parents always make excuses for them, they'll grow up to be mean. And, and if they, they're shielded from any kind of uh, punishment or, or the consequences, they'll grow up even being meaner. And, and then what ends up happening is they get out of sorts with their parents. Finally, their parents have to wash their hands of them. And then grandma jumps in a lot of times. And then grandma wants to protect them. And then, and then they're in prison and grandma's sending putting money on their books. Because everybody's mean and they're misunderstood. And you say, well, that's extreme. I can tell you a bunch of examples with names and faces. The reason that we need to develop a conscience is so we don't get to that point. We ought to, that's why, you, you know, to, it's, I always have mixed, mixed emotions when somebody gives somebody something. If somebody gives something to one of our kids, I'm always waiting for the thank you. Or if our kids do something wrong, I want them to say, I'm sorry. And sometimes kids don't mean it, and, and they're not sorry. They're, they're just, you know, they're just not necessarily honest. And so we've gotten on our kids about being honest. And for a little while, there was a window, there was a window in trying to teach our, our boys about stuff. And, um, and you'd ask them, why did you do that? And I don't know. I'm like, why are you lying? You do know. Because you're selfish. You want to, finally, our boys would start being honest. Like, why did you do that? Because I'm selfish, you know. And, which is horrible, but at least they were being honest. I don't know. I grew up not knowing, okay? Like, who did that? I don't know. 
And then as soon as they figured out that I was the one who did it, they're like, why did you do that? I don't know. Why did you lie? I don't know because I don't like getting beat on. That's why. I'm selfish and I don't like facing consequences. That's why. I mean, you know, that's, that's the truth. That's why we do bad things. Because we want it our way, whether it's right or wrong. And then why don't we just fess up to it? Because we don't like consequences. I, I was having to get after a young, young person one time. And, man, it, it was a teenage uh, girl. And I couldn't, I couldn't get on to her by myself. And, and but she needed to be gotten on to. So I called her parents. It broke my heart. And, and we got them in. And, man, I'd already cried and was praying and crying some more. And, and so, anyway, I, I asked the girl. I said, hey, you're involved in something really bad. I already know about it. Just tell your parents and we'll be done with it. And, and, and it just, it carried on until the fact that she, she was calling me a liar until the parents were mad at me. And they said, you need to stop accusing our daughter and this and that. And finally I was like, here, look at this. And man, when they looked at it, all of a sudden the little girl was like, oh, I'm sorry. I, do you really? And I'm just asking. I was there. I didn't see sorry. I saw sorry getting caught. Not sorry for what they had done. Yeah. See, there's a difference. That's not a conscience. A conscience is not sorry that you got caught. A real conscience is being sorry that you did what you did. And, and what we need to have is a good conscience. Here in verse number 9 of chapter number 8 of the book of John, as Jesus is speaking to these who brought this young lady who was caught in the very act of adultery, uh, they, their minds, at least they had a conscience. And Jesus said, you know, they said, hey, Moses said we're supposed to bash your brains out. We're supposed to stone her to death. What say you? Well, Jesus didn't say Moses was wrong. He just said, well, whichever one, whoever it is, that's without sin right here. You take the first one, bash your brains out. Can you imagine if only one person had just been completely right with God, they could have bashed their brains out and been done with it? But beginning with the eldest, he knew he wasn't right. And his conscience got to him. And he walked away. And there was another one who might have been standing there with a the, with the brick in his hand. And he looks at the older guy leaving. He's like, I guess I need to go too. And all the way down till the last one walked out. And here's this girl on the ground waiting, waiting to have her brains bashed in. According to the law, she was guilty, taken in the very act. She's guilty. She deserved it. Absolutely. But Jesus, through one question, afforded her great mercy. He didn't say they couldn't bash her in the head. He just said the first one that is without sin. He, he, should, be, he should be the first one. Anyone that's without sin. If one guy would have stood up and bashed her in the head, everybody else could have joined in. It was just the first one that had to be sinless. But the eldest, he knew. And then that left the next eldest to guess be the leader. And he knew. And the next one knew. And the next one knew. You know, something wonderful happens when we come to terms with our own sin. Something wonderful happens when we come to terms with the fact that sometimes we're wrong. When we have a conscience, it makes it difficult to put up a holier-than-thou front and be judgmental of everybody else. By the way, that's not a bad thing. It's always easier to point out someone else's sin. Have you ever asked in a group of kids, point out one of them and ask them why they did what they did? Nine times out of 10, maybe 99 times out of 100, they don't say, the first word out of their mouth is not I. Usually it's somebody else's name. In our family of four brothers, you stop and you go, boy, why did you do that? Brother did this, and that when they're naming names. They're naming names. Why did you do what you did? Because so and so, no, no, no. Why did you do what you we're gonna to talk to so and so? 
Why did you do it? You know, that punishment's about to get doled out. You know, I'm not saying we might get away with a crime. I'm not saying we might get away with something. But the punishment may not be as bad if we would just fess up and get it right. If we would allow our conscience to convict us. My, my older sisters joke around. I had a cousin Richard before he, he just passed away this last year. and My cousin Richard, when he was a kid, they would all be playing and doing something. All of a sudden, Richard would disappear for a few minutes and he would come by and in the back of his pants, there would be a full book outline. And you would just see the outline of book in his jeans. And it was because he had done wrong. And he didn't want to get in trouble. I had a niece. Her name was Amy. Now, my nieces were older. They're almost my age. And... and uh, my niece Amy, we'd be all playing, doing stuff, and all of a sudden you'd look over and Amy would be over with her nose in the corner. You're like, did you get in trouble? <laughs> no. You're like, hey mom, why has Amy got her nose in the corner? It's like, Amy, what'd you do? I'm sorry. She's like pre-punishing herself. Standing with her nose in the corner. You're like, what is that? I tell you what had happened. Her conscience told her she had done wrong. Yep. Now she didn't go confess it, but it wasn't hard to figure out she had done something wrong when she was standing in the corner. I mean, she'd stand there forever till somebody came by and you had to pull. Then you had to pull it out of her what she had done wrong. You know, Jesus and Peter have conversations with Pharisees concerning um, putting a, a yoke on other people and having expectations on other people that they are not even willing to live by themselves. If you want to see where Jesus said it, just read the Gospels a few times and you'll see it everywhere. Uh, Peter takes on the, uh, the Pharisees in Acts 15 in chapter, in verse number 10. He says this, Now therefore why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? You go over and look at Matthew 23 and Jesus is nailing their hides to the wall for the same thing. See, the Pharisees always wanted to put greater expectations on other people than they were willing to put on themselves. And boy, it's good to, no, no, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. Boy, we love to quote Jesus and call people Pharisees. But we're the same way. We can all outline, whoa, what's wrong with everybody else's kids? But our kids... Everybody can point out everybody else's sin. But what about my sin? We need to be careful that we're not putting unreasonable expectation on other people when we haven't taken care of ourselves. The conscience literally means the ability to self-assess concerning right and wrong. That's what a conscience is. A conscience is the ability to self-assess whether you're doing right or wrong. Sometimes you can mess up, and throughout the scriptures it's very apparent, you can mess up somebody else's conscience. If they think that you're a good Christian and you're doing something worldly, they'll go, oh, that's okay, and they'll do that. And here's the problem. You go, oh, but I was only... that. Listen, that's one of the reasons I don't drink. Now, I'm afraid I would end up being a drunk and I don't need that in my life and I'm prohibited in Scripture. But even before I was the pastor of the church, I didn't believe in drinking. One of the reasons I didn't is because I have family members that were alcoholics. And do I think that drinking a beer would send me to hell? No, I don't. And I've never tasted beer. And I'm thankful for that if it... If it taste anything like it smells it's awful don't know why anybody would drink that <laughs> heard somebody say one time that they tried to send off and figure out what made it smell so bad and they they sent it off to texas a&m to the lab but somewhere in transit the label fell off so they just tested it did the best they could and they they sent it back and said your stuff came in without a label on it but we went ahead and tested it and we can tell you your horse has tb and uh you you think on that for a minute and I'll help you. 
Go, go back to Matthew chapter number 7. Back up to Matthew chapter number 7. It's okay to smile. Now you heard the casting the first stone. Now you're going to hear the other argument the world gives you on why we're not allowed to judge anything. Although the Bible says the spiritual should judge all things. But here's what they say. Matthew chapter number 7 summed up in two words. Judge not. That's not chapter 7 all summed up. <laughs> judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall also be measured to you again. In other words, hey, you better be straight. You better be right if you're complaining about other people being messed up. You better make sure that you're toeing the line before you start complaining about everybody else. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam that is in thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. It doesn't mean hate the sin, love the sinner. That, that verse doesn't exist. What it means is your brother having a, a, a little moat in his eye, having a little splinter in his eye, that's a problem. But if you're going to help him with that problem, you better take care of the problems in your, in your own life first. So you can see clearly. See, I'm talking about developing a conscience. So that before you just point your finger at everyone else, you take some time with the person in the mirror first. And make sure that your heart's right. You make sure that your situation is right. Make sure that your life is something that's glorifying God before we go around with the critical spirit trying to take care of everybody else's. By the way, there's no place in Scripture that says, Have ye therefore a critical spirit and go thou about uh, judging everyone else in spite of yourself. It's always about take care of yourself first. And give yourself just a minute to see where you're at. A little self-evaluation. Give, I've given the example a bunch. We're in the middle of summer and almost every week two people die at the lake. The other day uh, there was a story about a... Um, about a young man, he died. He was a strong, good swimmer. But his friend got out in the, in the river. And his friend couldn't swim. So this guy goes into hero mode. Jumps right into the river. Saved his friend. Hero! He died. The guy who could not swim got saved. And the good, strong swimmer got swept away trying to be a hero because he wasn't quite as good as he thought he was. There's a lot of people that go out in the lake and they're like, we're fine, we're fine. And then somebody else goes out and they get a little too deep, a little too far. Uh, the, the undertow gets them and they, they get pulled under the water. And then the superhero goes in and tries to save them and they both die. One goes to drowning, the other one tries to help them. He gets drugged down, he dies. Then the other one goes back to not knowing how to swim again and dies himself. All the time here in Texas lakes, people die two at a time. One that should have been really careful in the water and one that never should have been in the water in the first place. But in Christianity, people get drugged down all the time because you have somebody who just got right, just got saved, just decided to be a hero. They, they're a mediocre swimmer at best in spirituality. And then they see somebody who has a, a problem. It's not as big as their problem. My problems are my little pet sin over here. I'm just going to stay over here with my little pet sin. It's not hurting anybody. God understands because me and God are like this. We have a special deal worked out. Sure you do. But you see somebody with a bigger sin, so you try to help them. You go into lifeguard mode. Next thing you know, nobody's in church. Everybody's destroyed. Everybody's headed to rehab. Hey, everybody's going to jail. It's a mess. Don't try to be a lifeguard. Just throw a line. Just throw the line out. Throw them a rope. 
try to draw them into the shore. I've got three points. Reasons we need to, and how we might go about developing a conscience. Number one, clean house. Clean house. In other words, don't complain about others while you're tripping over your own mess. I don't go around going, man, your kids are loud. My kids are loud. When missionaries come, I don't hold our missionaries to unrealistic expectations. I know a lot of uh, preachers who, man, when, when missionary kids come, you can almost see the fear in the, in, in the missionary's kids' eyes. And they're just like little robots. Got their little suit and tie on. We're perfect. Little angels. First thing I do is I say, Dad, just relax. I mean, you don't want them swinging from the lights and starting fires and stuff, but <laughs> let them be kids. And we had that attitude before we had kids. We need to clean house. But you know what also we need? We need a clear heart. We need a clear heart. Guiltless faith. Guiltless faith is wonderful faith. Listen, we've all got things that we don't do perfectly. We all mess up in some areas. We're all stronger in some places and we're weaker in some other places. Listen, guard yourself against those weak places. Guard yourself so that you don't get, get into, into bad places. I heard a statistic that gave just a ridiculous number about um, preachers in the internet and problems with pornography and stuff. And that scares me. Because I don't have that problem, but a lot enough people do that I take heed. So I give my password out. My wife has it. My secretary has it. My associate pastor has it. You go, that's crazy. You give your password out to everybody? Sure. They can go on to my Facebooks, my email. Sometimes they're like, hey, what about this? I go, I don't know how to do something. Here, just go on. They're like, which password is that? I'm like, don't ask me which password. You need to know the password. You need to be going on and checking. I want them to check. And you go, that's weird, preacher. I like accountability. Accountability is a good thing. If we're ever leaving the house and our two oldest boys are staying home for a couple of minutes by themselves, I'm like, hey, tell on each other. <laughs> Be good. Y'all watch each other. Be ready to knock each other out. And then we leave it. And I know they will. That's wonderful. I would never leave one home by themselves. No accountability. You leave two, may not stop them from doing something, but at least I'm going to be there to knock them out. And that's a good thing. <laughs> if we could just learn to, to, to protect ourselves, and, the, and when we do mess up, to get it right and move forward. That way, I mean, we can, that helps us so much. And it'll help us to have a better attitude about everything in life. It can teach us to, if, we're, if we have guiltless faith, if our heart is clear, listen, it's easier to show kindness. It's easier, it's easier to show forgiveness if our heart's cleared. The reason we hold things up and, and the reason we're mad at people is not because they've done us wrong, it's because our heart's not right. Now you think about that. that. That may hurt a bunch of our feelings this morning, but I'm telling you that's the truth. The reason that you're harboring and the reason that I harbor bad feelings toward other people who have said and done things wrong to us is not because of what they've done, but because of our inability to clear our heart of unforgiveness and to forgive like we're commanded to forgive in Scripture. Amen, preacher, that's good. Amen, preacher, that'll help me. Amen, preacher, that just pricked my conscience that I'm trying to develop under the leadership of the Holy Spirit during this message. We need to have a clean house. We need to have a clear heart. And we need to have a close walk. We need to have a close walk with the Lord. Listen, if you want to have a, develop a good conscience... Humanly speaking, humanly, do you know what one person I care what they think more than anybody else? It's my wife. Why? Because we lay down next to each other every night and she's a good shot. <laughs> I care what she thinks because she is taking care of me. She takes care of our children. I care what my wife thinks. So I want to please her. Because we walk together. We take date nights together. Listen, I love her. And we're together. The, the two flesh became one. And I love her dearly and I want to please her. Because we walk together, I want to please her. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? 
If you want to help yourself in having a clean conscience and developing a good conscience toward the Lord, walk close to Him. You'll learn to love what He loves. You'll learn to hate what He hates. You'll learn to step in step with His will. We used to, we had a dog one time and he was a mess. Man, we started immediately trying to look up how to train a dog. And there was this weird lady that was in the basement of the city hall thing and she taught down in the basement how to train a dog. And our dog was nuts. He was a rescue dog and he didn't have a lick of sense. But he loved us. You know what we taught him to do? Man, we got in there and they, they put this awful chain. Oh, it was terrible. I hated that thing. It had spikes on the inside. And, but, and you know what? It, it just got that dog's attention. And, and she'd say, she said, don't yank on it, but pop it. And I thought, but I don't want to hurt my dog. She goes, you want him to be like this forever? He'll run out in the street and get killed. I was like, no, I don't want him to get killed. She said, just pop it. Maybe you'd pop it and that dog would kind of just look. And then we started walking with him. And that dog would walk right in step. And he had to stay right there on that left side and as you walked. And if you started to turn, he didn't go. You popped that chain. And man, he started walking in step with us. Pretty soon, he didn't even need a chain. We, we, we kind of broke the leash laws a little bit, which I'm not for. But anyway, we, we'd walk outside. And man, that dog just got to where he would stay right on your leg. And if you turned, he would turn. And if you turned this way, he would turn to the inside. If you started to turn to the outside, he came around wide. And he always stayed right in step with you. And he turned into a really good dog. And one day we opened up the door. And there was a, a dog running across the park. And he started running. And this car was right there. And the dog never saw the car. And man, I yelled at our dog. His name was Nick. I was like, Nick, down! And Nick just threw on the brakes and hit his belly at the end of our driveway, and that car went right by. The car never saw Nick. Nick never saw the car. And we almost had to clean up our dog off the street. But you know what had happened? We had done some, it was awful stuff we had to do to train that dog. I hated it. They did control downs, where you just held the dog down for first just like 10 seconds. It's horrible. And then you upped it to 30 seconds. And then you upped it to a minute. And then pretty soon you'd hold your dog down until that dog was completely calm. And then, then you'd just put your hand on the dog. You didn't have to push hard. And you'd just put your hand on the dog and he'd stay there for 20 minutes. That's a control down. Pretty soon you'd say, down. And that dog would get down and your voice was as if your hand or your body was laying on that dog. And you go, that sounds stupid. That's cruel. All I know is it saved our dog's life. And it taught our dog to walk in step with us. It taught our dog to be there. It taught our dog to be a good dog, to be obedient and faithful. And you know what? He turned into a really awesome dog. Now, I hate to use an illustration that kind of compares us to dogs. But Jesus did, so I don't feel so bad. We're Gentiles. He called us dogs. Jesus is always so kind. Yeah, except when he's calling a lady and his kid dogs. Yeah. <laughs> We need to have a close walk to the Lord. Now listen, that may mean that we have to go through some tough times of just, ah, oh, I want to do something so bad, but I can't. Control them. And then pretty soon you learn to listen to the voice of our master. And we walk in step with him. Friend, if we just learn to develop a close walk with the Lord, God does some amazing things. God's not going to lead us into, hazard, into a hazardous way. God's not going to allow us to get plowed over in the middle of the street. If we're walking with him, we need to have a close walk, but we need to have our, our conscience developed. The reason is so that the Holy Spirit of God can do serious work in our lives that allows us to be at a place where we don't say, I don't know how it happened. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I'm so sorry. If you're so sorry, why were you lying five minutes ago? I've heard people swear to our God, offer to put hands on Bibles, and then turn out that they were just blatantly lying and they knew it. You know what that is? That is no conscience. That is no conscience. You could go over to 1 Timothy and look at the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy and just look at what happens when someone has their conscience seared. It's wickedness. It's wickedness. In fact, he even tells them uh, in 1 Timothy chapter number 1, he says, Under the pure, all things are pure, but under them that are defiled and unbelieving, 
is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Do you realize that if you're pure, a goody-goody, as somebody might say, that's a good thing. Sometimes somebody will say, you know, and, and I'm not real hip on, I'm not real hip on anything, but, um, but sometimes I'll say something and somebody will snicker because I've said something bad that I didn't know I said. And they'll, and I'm like, what, what happened? What'd I just say? And they're like, this, and then it's from some movie or something. And apparently you're not, you know, it was something really bad. And I said a phrase that now means something totally different that was never meant to. And I'm like, well, I didn't say that to be ugly. I didn't say it to be bad. I, I don't know. I hadn't been to the movies in like 14 years. I don't know. I don't know what that's all about. And so that it's okay. I think it's okay to not be cool in those areas. But if you're looking to do good, you'll do good. Nothing, you know, what did he say? He said, under the pure, all things are pure. He says, but under them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. You can have people that, that they'll be reading scripture and they'll see something in the scripture and be like, <laughs> and they're thinking something bad about the word of God. They'll take something vile and place it in scripture. Why? Because their minds are that way. Our conscience ought to convict us of that. Our comp belong before somebody says, hey, that's wrong. We ought to stop and go, Lord, I'm sorry. Amen. Lord, developing a conscience is the ability to self-examine and say, Lord, I'm sorry before you ever get caught. It allows us the ability to repent before it becomes a public matter. It's getting right before you get busted. Instead, some people are defiant even after they're busted. We need to clean house. We need clear hearts. We absolutely need a close walk with the Lord. We need to have the kind of conscience that at the end of a, of a church service, you don't need some invitation with the music playing and this and that. Man, the Holy Spirit of God ought to be bugging you, hitting me, hitting you. I know, listen, I pray over these messages. Sometimes even before I preach them, God's already convicted me. There's times I'm in the middle of preaching going, I don't even know why I'm saying this out loud. Uh, it, this is just for me. I could have just read this, Lord. And it's so obvious to me that I think everybody must know. But that's because I want to walk close to the Lord. I want to have a clean house. I want to have a clear heart. I want to be right. Oh, how I want to be right. Not for the pride of being right, but for the pleasing of my Lord, for the glorification of my Father, Heavenly Father. We ought to desire to be right. We ought to desire to be right enough to admit that we're wrong. We ought to have a desire to be right that we're, we're, we're man enough or woman enough to step out and come down and just pray in private and get things right with God. You say, well, I'm having a problem with my parents. Get your life right with God and you can get it right with parents. We went to camp a couple of weeks ago and, and the preacher didn't even preach. They were just having a music time. And these girls were singing. And all of a sudden this teenage boy and amongst the other many groups that had gone up, but one boy went by himself and prayed. Man, he, he picked up a, some tissue was just blowing snot. And, and man, he was blubbering. And he got up and he walked across where his mom, he wasn't even sitting close to his mama. And he went over and said, Mama, I'm sorry. And he hung up, hung, just hung his arms around his mama's neck. Got right with his mama. Yesterday morning, I preached a funeral right here. And I preached on freedom and how even though we're free in Jesus Christ, so many people go back and build prisons for themselves through unforgiveness and addictions and problems and all these other things. And, and that's not God's desire in our life. And we need to learn to forgive. And hey, there's probably somebody that needs to write a letter to somebody or make a phone call to somebody and apologize to somebody. Hey, there's just somebody that needs to get rid of their stinking pride today and break out of the prison of pride and do something today to, to get free and probably apologize to somebody. Man, I got up and, and the, the, the wife of the deceased guy came over and, and I noticed people were looking and this one guy had gotten up. One guy headed out. He's a big dude. And this big dude over here is like the biggest two dudes in the, in the rooms other than me. And they, they walked out and 
Man, they met over there in the foyer, and I didn't know what was going on. And, and the lady was looking, a few people were looking real nervous. And the wife came over to me, and she said, Preacher, thank you. And I said, for what? And she said, those two out there, look at them. And I looked out there, and they were hugging. Said they've hated each other's guts for 10 years. In the same family, but they hadn't talked for 10 years. But God used his word. I didn't know that situation. I didn't know, but God knew. And I don't know if any other good came from that guy dying. I didn't know him. But I know this, a couple of dudes that had spent a decade hate, harboring hatred for one another. Walked out there with tears in their eyes. Said, hey man, I'm sure sorry. They shook hands, they hugged, and they sat out there talking for a long, nobody else would even go out there. Everybody kind of came by and saw the family and just sat back down. I was like, are any of these people going to walk by here? And they said, oh, they've already been out. They're just leaving them alone. I didn't know we was about to call 911. I didn't know what was happening. Everybody was looking. But nobody dared go out. And they let them do business. They let them get right. What a hallelujah moment when somebody gets right. Amen. It'd be a hallelujah moment if all of us got right. Hey, it could be that one of us is having a hard time forgiving somebody for something that was said, something that was done against us. And listen, nothing, we can't undo what was said. We can't undo what was done. But you can forgive somebody. You say, but they haven't asked me. Then you'll stay in prison all your life. Right. You'll be just as miserable and defiant as you are today. Or you could let your conscience convict you of unforgiveness and realize that you too have sinned. And it would help you to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my part. And I, I just want it to be right. And I, I, I'm either asking you to forgive or not. What, I mean, whatever. I'm sorry for my part. With no expectation. Somebody says, well, I don't forgive you. You're like, well, fine. I'm back in prison again. <laughs> don't do that. Just forgive them. They say, hey, if they say no, you say, well, I hope one day you can. I love you. And leave it alone. But at least you did your part. Hey, that's what developing a conscience is, is just doing your part. Allowing the Holy Spirit to convict us so we can do our part. We can't change other people. We can't. Man, I beat my head against the wall for nearly a decade trying to change other people. All I can do is preach God's word and get out of the way. But you've got to let the Holy Spirit do something. If you're here today and you're not saved... You need to be saved. I can't save you, but God can. Amen. If you'll come down to the front, I'll show you how. But it's between you and God. If you're here today and you're harboring hurt, hurtful feelings, maybe it's somebody here. Maybe it's me. Please forgive me. If I was mad at you back, I've already forgiven you. That's one thing. Hey, I can't even go to sleep at night until I've forgiven everybody. I'd never sleep if I was waiting for everybody to forgive me, but I hope they do. I don't mean any harm at all. God loves you and I love you. I want you to love me back. But we need to have a, a clean conscience. We need to have a convicting conscience. We need to have a forgiving conscience. One that helps us realize that, hey, somebody did something bad. It's about par for the course. I did something bad. So I need to take care of my bad so before I can long, before I can ever help somebody else to get their bad taken care of. All my bad's got to be out of the way. I got to clean my own house. I got to clear my own heart. I got to be walking with the Lord if I'm going to help other people do the same. Would you join me today in just trying to have a clean conscience? Trying to clean up our own mess? We all want to help somebody do right. It makes our lives easier when other people aren't stupid. But we can't do that if we're tripping over our own messes. Let's get it right. For the Lord's sake. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. It is convicting. I want to be like the Apostle Paul who many times was able to say he had a pure and clean conscience. 
Help us, Lord, to be all that you'd have us to be. Help us to be Christ-like in our forgiveness. Help us to be Christ-like in our love for others. Help us to be Christ-like in our hatred of sin. But help us to be compassionate like Christ, to show mercy like Christ, to extend grace like Christ. Maybe there's somebody this morning that just needs Christ. Whatever the need, Lord, I pray you'd have your perfect way and will right now. Right now as we go to invitation, I pray you'd have your way and will in Jesus' name. Let's all stand.